Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Brain Club. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm the executive director of All Brains Belong. And I'm so excited that you have all joined us to talk about inclusive hybrid meetings. First, um, before we get started, just to mention that closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. And if you change your mind, you want to turn them off, you can do the same and choose hide subtitles. So first, what is, what is Brain Club? Um, I know that there are many, many folks who are new to Brain Club today, so welcome. And uh, welcome, welcome back to everyone who's not new. Um, so All Brains Belong um, has been almost for, almost for almost three years. We've been running this education program for purposes of demonstrating our approach to neuroinclusive culture and shifting broader community awareness, trying to um, you know bring up everyday life topics and explore them with folks both from within the ABB community or like tonight, bringing in allies from outside of the ABB community, our community partners with whom we collaborate um, in trying to transform culture by modeling what's possible. Um, what we hope for you is that this is a place where you feel safe a place where you can experience how culture can be different and where we can collectively learn and unlearn together. And while Operings Belong has many different types of programs that do many different types of things, this one is not for medical or mental health advice. It's not a support group or a place to make personal requests or address personalized needs. It's an education space where we invite you to listen, learn, observe what a neuro-inclusive space looks like and think about how what you're learning connects to your life. There is no one right way to participate here. Um, you can have your video on or off. Even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the camera or any of those things. So feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat or take breaks or anything else that needs doing. There will be portions of tonight where we'll be um, have open for discussion and questions. And you can do that um, with mouthwords in the chat. Um, or, or not at all. Observation is a, is a valid form of participation. Um, and in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, um, one of the um, things that is important to us here at All Brings Belong um, is that we, we, we're always thinking about the collective. So we prioritize the group's needs over that of the individual. Um, so just as a reminder to check in with yourself before participating in group discussion. And um, um, that's my visual support to make sure the chat's open, it's showing you all where the chat is, if you'd like to use that. So um, uh, for, for many of you who are new to Brain Club, this everything's new, so it uh, may, not, may not stand out that something is new, but this is only the second week that we've launched our new format. So for Brain Club regulars, um, if you missed last week, Brain Club 2.0 launched last week, a revamped program based on community feedback. For our format um, tonight for our 45 minute program, I'm going to tell you about our topic and our presenters. And we're going to watch a, um, an asynchronous uh, panel presentation. It was pre recorded. Um, and then we'll have a pause in the middle of it um, for discussion and questions. Then we'll watch the second half of the presentation and open it up for discussion and questions. And out of respect to the panelists, we will be disabling the chat during the presentation. So um, ideas for what to do while the chat is closed, um, considering um, uh, setting up your space, having things available to you like food or drink or things that help you focus, um, maybe a document or a notebook if you want to take notes or draw or anything else that helps you regulate and focus. Um, we are uh, continuing our theme this month about inclusive community and this topic fits right in there. Um, you know, I think when we think about hybrid meetings, uh, sometimes there's the thought that, you know, maybe this is about convenience. It's not about convenience. Um, this is so much more than that. This is about ensuring that every voice, every perspective, people with all types of brains and bodies can participate meaningfully in whatever, um, you know, whatever's being offered. So it's really a vital, we think it's a vital part of building a world where all people can feel like they belong. And it's a vital part of building a world where we can advance um, conversations about, you know, how do we create a world that works for everyone? 
So um, reimagining how we gather is a part of that. So uh, what you'll get to hear tonight are some examples of best practices before, during, and after a hybrid meeting, and give some examples of uh, both high-tech and low-tech setups. So um, uh, while we watch uh, this first part of this panel presentation, um, an optional prompt for consideration. You know, have you had experience with hybrid meetings? I think many people have, and many people there hasn't necessarily had positive experiences with hybrid meetings. And I think for many people, um, it's like thought to be of, you know, I want to avoid those things because it didn't go well last time. But if you had had experience about what worked well for you, even parts of things that worked well for you, see if you can reflect about those things while you listen to our first part of our panel. Um, all right, so um, the before, during, and after that you'll get to hear about. Um, first, I just want to give a context for how this uh, this this particular panel came about. Um, All Brains Belong was fortunate enough to receive support um, uh, through the uh, health equity grant through the Vermont Department of Health in 2022 um, in collaboration with the Vermont Community Foundation. And at the end of um, the, the year and a half um, that, of that grant period, um, the Vermont Department of Health and the Vermont Community Foundation convened all the grantees at the Echo Leahy Center for uh, Lake Champlain. And it was the best hybrid meeting of all time. I had never experienced anything like it. So I reached out. Um, to the Vermont Community Foundation, the Vermont Department of Health. I said, you got to teach us how you did that. It was amazing. And that is uh, what brings brings our panelists. So we um so excited uh, to, to share with you this conversation with Song Nguyen, who is the Director of Health Equity from the De Vermont Department of Health, and Evelyn Geerty, um, who is the Community Philanthropy Program Fellow from the Vermont Community Foundation. I will... Stop share and reshare and actually click the share sound button. Here we go. Uh, uh, so I'm Evelyn Gertie. I work at the Vermont Community Foundation as the Community Philanthropy Program Fellow, and I use she, her pronouns. Hi everyone, I'm Song Wen Shi Her Hers. I'm the Director of Health Equity with the Vermont Department of Health. Um, and we worked in coordination with Vermont um, Community Foundation, um, specifically Evelyn, um, to put on a hybrid event. Awesome. So I'm curious if we could rewind and what led to the decision to hold a hybrid event? Because like it's it's hard it's extra it's like requires some advanced planning you can't just show up um so what what led to the decision to do that honestly i think the catalyst was our conversation with you mel um <laughs> which is really funny it's kind of come full circle in that way um but just you did a really great job of advocating for the need to have events like this be held hybrid in order to be inclusive of everyone and everyone's needs i would i would echo a blood sentiment and also name that um, recognizing that uh, our team's work strives to enhance health equity across the work that we do. Um, it, it wouldn't have been wise if we didn't offer a hybrid option um, just to recognize that people are in very different spaces and to just offer that as, as an option for those that would feel more comfortable joining um, in a hybrid mode that song right because it's like um consistency of messaging versus internal values and what you do as an organization to to live out those values right because from an equity lens um, of who gets to show up there are so many people who can't show up at in-person events and so you know when you have to choose between full participation in your life um versus maybe protecting your health or maybe you have childcare responsibilities or maybe it's just simply too expensive to get gas to drive across the state to go to something there's so many reasons that um to evelyn's point about making so that everyone can participate 
Let's say that an organization decides that they want to offer a hybrid event, but they don't know how. I thought maybe we could talk through like the before, during, and after um, of the health equity grantee convening um, that went so well. And I, I also just want to name, because I, I told Evelyn this, but Song, I didn't tell you this. This is the best hybrid event I've ever attended. Like, like as an attendee, I, I legitimately felt in, like, I wasn't expecting this. I like legitimately felt included. I've never felt included. You know, I'm like, I'm always grateful when there's like, you know, even a live stream, not the same as hybrid with like interaction, mm -hmm. but um, I'm grateful when there's even that because of all the, 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 the all the, the things that are not that. Um, but legitimately, I felt like my participation was equivalent to that of an in-person attendee, which I've never felt before. So I just really want to thank you both. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Can we talk about the process? I remember both of you reaching out to me beforehand and asking, of, essentially, you didn't use these words, but you asked about my access needs. You asked about what, what would I need for full and meaningful participation? Um, can you talk about the decision to ask the participants ahead of time about that? Like, is that, that is, I'm gonna, that goes on the slide of best practices. Do with our like our community advisory board meetings um those surveys go out ahead of time you know and and here's a menu of things um that we are planning to offer which of these things do you think to check all the things that would be helpful to you in addition to is there anything else free text that you share yeah and we we did include that sort of question in our registration you also sort of have to be careful about the way that you ask that because sometimes people don't know what they need and offering some options and examples is really great to get people's you know, wheels turning. Um, so we had, I think you asked for captions um, and we were sure to add those to all of the virtual screen for both people in person. I think they were able to see that and virtual. So. The, the decision to sort of connect with you in advance of the meeting, I think that's one of the benefits of having some level of relationship with um, folks that are participating in your programming is you can have sort of like an informal, casual conversation um, to support planning processes ahead. So just being able to connect with you, knowing that um, you would, you know, very um, comfortably share some of the needs that would be beneficial for you to support your participation in the event um, and be willing to share that, I think was one, but also recognizing that when we do identify areas um, to support someone who has needs to participate virtually, there are lots of elements to that that benefit any anybody um, who's in that space. So like other folks who, um, I know that there were a couple of team members on the health department side who joined virtually, also had a really beneficial experience um, and maybe joined the event for very different purposes than you may have, Mel, um, but they still were able to, to hear everybody, feel connected with everybody, um, and join in a meaningful way. So I do think even just having like that one conversation with one person who might share a list of really um, helpful recommendations benefits the entire event. Awesome. Great. And like, you know, um, uh, if, if you ask, if you ask a person in an open ended way, like, what are your needs? Uh, I don't know. Right. But, but it was the combination of, um, you know, we, we built that menu. Um, you know, because I, I remember that conversation with you. I, I gave you a lot of needs that I need for hybrid participation, um, and and you did them all. That's the other thing. Like you were responsive to my feedback because that's that that that's something that's not taken for granted. Lots of people are asked for feedback, um, and then you don't know what becomes of that feedback. It was you know from a participant standpoint to see that um, you know so you implemented these things, um, and it, it it just it's. And a lot of the things, I mean, there's a lot of things that are, are, are very fancy and high tech and, you know, I wouldn't even have known that that's possible, those things. So I wouldn't have asked you for them because I didn't know they existed. We got extremely lucky with Echo. Um, they were just redoing their entire AV system and finished the project the day before our event. Um, right. The tech, of course, is, is so important. Um, and here in this example, you had a, like a, a really fancy venue with like all kinds of cool things like you know microphones both in the ceilings and mics that can be passed around you had a large screen tv so that the people in person could see the people who were virtual but also smaller screens on each of the tables so that the virtual participants could see the 
face of a human that they were interacting with in person. Um, and that was just so impressive to me. Um, and, you know, when I think back to when we've done hybrid events, um, you know, as, as a startup nonprofit um, with like a shoestring budget at the time in which we did um, a hybrid brain club, there were elements of that that were were able to be done even on a much smaller scale. But the concept of thinking about your microphones and thinking about your screens, um, that that I think is generalizable to other settings, even um, even on a much smaller scale. Yeah, definitely. I also think just having a person or more than one person who's dedicated to thinking about the hybrid um, person who is attending this event or people that are attending this event is really important because it's such a different perspective. I feel like oftentimes in hybrid events, the hybrid participants are kind of forgotten about and it's just like, oh wait, we forgot to check the chat or we forgot that these people are even here watching. And so there was somebody who's what we're, we've been calling the hybrid liaison um, and to be in that space and put her headphones in and sort of be a, a virtual participant while in the room, manage any anything that might go wrong and um, bring the people into the space. Whoa, so so uh, that's, that's a really interesting tech pearl um, that, that you just named about the headphones. So having your dedicated virtual liaison or hybrid liaison, that person had headphones in with a feed from the laptop that was right in front of them? Yep. There's been a million times that I've been a virtual participant of a hybrid event and like something's going wrong, can't hear, or there's like chaos, can hear too much. And no one is like, you're waving your arms, but nobody's looking at the screen or you're like, nobody's hearing you. Nobody's looking at the chat. Like, so it's very hard for an in-person facilitator to be doing both. Having been in that role, it's very hard to do both. So I, I, I love your point of having a dedicated liaison to the virtual participants. Yeah, and I will just add to, I, I like the title dedicated liaison for virtual. Um, I recognize that that role was essential in how smoothly the rest of the day rolled out for everyone who was joining virtually um, because they could just name when things were sort of too loud over the headset or someone was talking into the microphone in real time and we couldn't hear them for virtual participants. Um, so that role was instrumental in um, ensuring that everybody did have, a, you know, a smooth um, process specifically for those who were joining virtually, but it was, it did take a toll on that person in that moment, um, I think because some of the prep work hadn't happened um, prior to the event day. So that's definitely a lesson learned for me um, moving forward is recognizing that, that that is a very necessary role and to have been able to prepare around that position would have been helpful too. Totally. So like you, you knew it was, you, it's important. You didn't realize how important, how like mission critical that role is. We got the two, the two laptops. When you're speaking with your handheld mic up at the front of the room, other laptop is muted. Mm -hmm. Okay. And does other laptop ever get unmuted? I think only when that person needed to communicate with uh, the virtual participants, it was unmuted. Got it. And when there were transitions, when there was not someone presenting at the front of the room, that mic was muted so that the transition sound didn't come, come across. Right. Yeah, that was a really thoughtful inclusion. Like, that doesn't usually get done. Um, Song, from your perspective, anything else you remember about during, during the event? Um, in terms of during the event, I do remember wondering how this appeared to virtual folks when we were in a large circle in a big room um if that even came across like if virtual people could even hear um but it seemed like it it went okay it was the best part really so, okay yeah so um you because of the way you were able to position cameras with that overhead camera i think it really gave the illusion 
of being in the circle. I don't even think I can describe it appropriately. I'm like, I have no idea how I'm like laying on my couch with my long coat and I can't sit up and you know, I'm like laying on my couch and I'm like in a circle of people standing in a circle. Like how does this, how, how, anyway, that was so cool. I felt like I was there. Even to see the like the geometry of circle, like the way that you would look around in person and you see people in this formation, I felt the formation. What about after the event? How did how did how did that go? Um, so one thing that we did was we had a a survey. We got some good feedback on that, both things that we could have changed and uh, ways that people felt that it went well, um, and we don't didn't have a plan to hold another one of these so it's not like we could really implement it but it's always good to just debrief and think about how something went because i'm sure in some way shape or form we will hold hybrid events in our in our jobs in the future so and you're essentially still debriefing it now and so the idea being that while you may not have you know in your plans for 2025 a hybrid event um, the idea is like now now we're going to have a training material, right, that like people can take what you've learned and make their event more inclusive to the rest of the community. Whenever I have the experience of like in full transparency being excluded because of the lack of willingness to turn on a zoom from the computer you're sharing screens from like it doesn't have to be this i mean it was really cool to have this like elaborate tech system it also doesn't have to be an elaborate system i think that like the the lens and the intentionality of i want to include you that goes such a long way to queuing safety to virtual participants i want you to be here i want you to participate in some capacity versus like I, I literally could not be bothered to run Zoom because it, it could be that simple. Our attempt at Auburn's Belong. All right, we're going to pause here. Um, and um, we got one question in the chat um, that, that, I'll, that I'll get to, but this is an opportunity to, um, to ask questions, to comment on anything you heard that really stood out to you. Um, cause next, uh, we're then going to talk through a very low tech hybrid meeting setup, uh, which is, uh, how, how we do things here. So the question that came through in the chat, and by the way, um, let me turn on the chat. That should be back on. Oh, good. It's working. Okay. Um, so there's a question that came in, uh, what more will you do next time to prepare the dedicated liaison? Um, and, and Song and Evelyn did talk through that and it, it, uh, it didn't make the cut. Um, but essentially, um, what they reflected on was choosing the person in advance and that ideally it's someone, and I, I, uh, when we, when we, resume the, 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 the panel, um, I talk a little bit about this, about what our virtual liaison did, but essentially like having a list of activities that that person is going to be responsible for, which can be really all consuming. So it's very hard to like fully participate yourself when you are the virtual liaison. And that's what they shared, that they wish that they had appreciated um, differently in advance. Thank you, Jay and Danielle, for answering that question. Any other questions or comments about, you know, what stood out to you? Even, you know, I'd love, love to hear any reflections on um, the, the philosophy or the lens, like why this is so important. Michelle. Hello, thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm very curious as to exactly like what you said or how you phrased the question when you said hey you got to teach us how to do this because anytime i've approached people like to try to learn something from them they expect me to like sign up for something or pay them for something or you know i, I mean did you have to pay for the knowledge or did they really just network and, and share the knowledge freely 
Well, I think it really, um, uh, we are, we are fortunate um, that, um, you know, we had relationships with these folks. So mm -hmm. we had, we had worked with them for a year through the grant process. So we, we, we knew them really well, they knew us really well. And, you know, um, uh, really, really generous with their time and expertise. Um, you know, the, the idea of being able to invite voices in from outside our immediate community, um, you know, uh, really building building those alliances so we can all learn together. And, you know, I, I, I think with our with our two panelists in particular, these are both individuals who are so committed to, you know, inclusive community and, you um, they were, uh, uh, I don't know if they were truly as eager as they appeared to be to have conversation with me, um, but it was uh, it was great to collaborate on really like just like itemizing or not itemizing, like really breaking down like what did go into this before, during, analyzing. after, like structured reflection. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Sierra. Um, I really... <laughs> I really liked, um, which I think you pointed out as well, Mel, the, the fact that they had somebody who was interacting with Zoom as a Zoom participant would. Um, and I think that that goes to the point of basically having um, having like representation of all different types of access needs at a table, both kind of in planning, but also in the like actual execution of it. Um, you know, whether this person, it sounds like they were there in person, but just just having having people there who are accessing via all the different types um, of modalities at the same time makes such a huge difference than one person planning all of it. Absolutely, it's I mean it's 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 a team effort, um, and it's the idea of like, hey, I never would have thought about that. Thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. And I think that's that's what this is really all about. Having you know a a. A, a community of voices and perspectives. So that's, yeah. And I think that um, the idea of just solutions to problems coming from people being impacted by like what you're planning. And I think this, this event, you know, beyond the hybrid tech design, this particular event, um, the team at the Vermont Department of Health and the Vermont Community Foundation really went out of their way um, to gather input. Um, so there's a question, um, how did it feel in terms of interacting with other virtual participants? Yeah, what a great question, Paul. So I can say this as a, I, as a virtual participant of this hybrid event, um, usually when there's like this kind of passive option like no i'm not really connected to anybody in person or on zoom but in this particular way because there was essentially what the what how they um played out this role of the virtual liaison this person was essentially a sub facilitator who was facilitating community amongst the, the virtual participants which was really cool and i'd never seen that done before and what i'm going to show you um, when we do our low tech, I'm going to show you how we adapted um, what Michelle's commenting in the chat about the camera angle. Um, it like by the camera being located higher than the head of the in-person people, it gave the illusion from the, for the virtual people um, the illusion of actually being part of a circle. Um, and uh, um, I'm going to I'm going to turn back on the rest of the panel. We'll have plenty of time for discussion afterwards. We've got about 10 minutes left of the panel and then we'll have, um, you know, uh, some more time for questions and discussion. Um, but I, I, I just planting a seed um, that uh, you're you're about to hear about. Uh, so this 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 panel was recorded before a hybrid event that we did um, it was about a month prior to actually doing the event. Um, so, um, and, and what this was, which uh, thanks to Common Good Vermont and the Preservation Trust of Vermont, we had the opportunity to hold um, a, a meeting um, at the Lake House on Grand Isle. And uh, we, we, uh, we did not have any cameras in the ceiling, um, but we did our best and let's, let's hear about it.
Um, we are attempting uh, a hybrid event. Um, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a small event, but it's uh, we're doing a leadership retreat. There, there'll be, I'd say probably half the people will be virtual and half the people will be in person. And so um, I was hoping as we wrap up, I just to talk through how does like a, a small budget enterprise meet, like reflect some of these best practices that you've shared with us today. So um, the before, um, I think what I've learned from you, pre-assigning that liaison, it cannot be the event facilitator. It's got to be a separate person. I think from a tech standpoint, like um, we, we, we do not have cameras in the ceiling. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is I think I'm going to have two laptops and an iPad with a mount so that the iPad has a camera and it's mounted like to one of those clip-on stands. They're not expensive. Um, a clip-on stand like attached to a chair or something so that that experience of being part of the circle you know, it's not in the ceiling, but it's higher than the table. I think it might be that simple. I don't know. I mean, it might not work, but that's what, that's what we're going to try. And of course, uh, exploring participant access needs, everybody exploring everybody's access needs. And those access needs can be like tech related, visual hearing, but also like, um, like social communication related. You know, we are often probing for things on our menus, things like, um, you know, do you want the facilitator to call on you? Do you want the facilitator to never call on you? That's an access need too. It's too much pressure sometimes. So you've got this whole menu of, of, of needing access needs. Is there anything I've, you, you that, that's my synthesis of what you just told me. Did I miss anything from the before that we should try to do? I don't think so. I mean, it sounds like you're, you probably know your staff pretty well. And so having those relationships already in place is really helpful for planning something like this. And then a little, little trick of the trade is that oftentimes libraries have devices like owls and stuff that you can loan um so i would look at look into you know if your local library or fletcher free library in burlington or something might have an owl or some other device that would help you um in that event that's amazing um it also sounds like having someone on site know anything about technology for problem solving is probably something very important. Like when we've done hybrid things before, like we've done Brain Club hybrid on the State House lawn, we did that in partnership with people who know what they're doing. So we did that in partnership with Orca Media, um, who, you know, when like the mic doesn't communicate and the mic shuts off and the mic has feedback from the other mic, like that's what they do. They're experts in that. So that is probably something really important that we'll need to figure out. Um, I'd say, Mel, depending on how big um, that space is, it might not be necessary to, to have an additional microphone, especially if that's going to create more layers of like technology that needs to be managed by someone. I know that I would be a little like nervous if there was like a microphone thing that I had to try to figure out. Um, but I think it depends on like the size of the space. It might just be OK through um, the laptop microphone to be able to pick that up. And I wonder um, whether like the equivalent of the lazy Susan that spins 360, something that slides like down, like across a table, because it might be that the laptop microphone, I don't, I, it depends on how big the table is, but it might be that someone who's far away, the laptop might not pick them up. Um, what I've seen done, actually, I, I did a, I did a training for the Alchemist Brewery and I've never seen what, I've never seen this done before. It was, I thought, pure genius. They were all in person. I was virtual. They had all of their people join from a cell phone with headphones on. It was fascinating. Um, no feedback. Everyone was participating in their own way. It was really cool. Interesting. Yeah, because that mic is picking up local and everybody else is muted. So I think just there's there's ways of getting more sound input without like buying anything or renting anything. It's just yeah. about experimenting and having at least someone who, who knows some of the technology to like think through the problem solving. Because if you're like, ah, I'm scared of it, like, which is most people I know, um, you know, I can't problem solve because I can't even engage with it. Ah, technology, right? So, so that. I would say too, if all else fails, um, 
just having having like someone call into the meeting and just having like someone's phone just be like the voice um, or the microphone. Person, anything else that that I that like complete mission critical for during? Not that I can think of, other than just that liaison also being attentive to the chat and um, just having knowledge of people's needs. You know what's interesting? Um, that just made me think about um, we're going to make a, a a visual support for the liaison. So the visual support, like a, a chart with the access needs of the virtual participants. If somebody told us they um, want to be called on, you know, like that's a thing that I, as the facilitator and the the, the uh, remote liaison, virtual liaison, should know about and like respect. Like if people took the time to tell us the thing, we should do the thing that they asked for. Um, as you did. Um, I also think that a visual support of these little details, like during transitions, mute, like just listing them out, because there's a, there's there's not that many of them, but they're so important that um, if you have the kind of brain that is dependent on visual supports um, from an executive functioning standpoint, I think that um, anyway, uh, uh, m m m most of our team at All Brains Belong would benefit from a visual support of those things. And then after the, the debriefing. And the sharing, as you're doing now, sharing what you've learned um, so that other organizations um, can, can try something like that. Um, because I think, I think in the spaces I'm in, fortunately, the, the lens of I want people to be included, inclusion is important to me. Fortunately, people, I think they at least say that and mostly think that. They just may not be thinking of this piece as being related to inclusion. And it is. Mm -hmm. On the note of sharing, this might be something more pre-event. Um, but I think also just letting folks know, Mel, like when the, the event that you're speaking about um, specifically with your organization, letting folks know all of the considerations that you're planning around. Um, in some ways can sort of maybe let folks feel a little bit more comfortable and seen and heard but because i think having this conversation with us alone is wonderful um and um you've taken the time to sort of explore what our process was so you can benefit the work that you're doing for your own organization so um and i think it's okay for organizations to like also know your limitations and still be making an effort, even a partial effort. So for example, um, at the Community Health Education Fair in a couple of weeks, um, we have recognized that we don't have capacity to run a full hybrid event. We don't have someone to be a dedicated on-site liaison. We don't have someone to facilitate the chat. We don't have that. So the next step down is a live stream. But there's still there's still something because that's what we have capacity to do, and that's okay. There might be things that are different in the future. But, um, we it, it, it's it's the idea of just of scaling. It's this is what we're able to do with people we know. This, like facilitating the general public is a completely different skill set, and we, it's not an all. I guess my point is it's not an all or nothing thing. Yeah, I think almost as important as the planning piece and thinking ahead piece is just the flexibility in the moment. Um, and being able to shift and accommodate for whatever comes up in that moment. And I guess even ahead of time, if your capacity is not um, where you'd like it to be for a certain event, just scaling down. Yeah, scaling down, asking for help and or scaling down. Um, it's not like, oh yeah, I can't, it can't be perfect. So I'm just not gonna do it at all. Yeah, just putting the effort in is something. Totally. All right. Any any other thoughts that you'd like to share before we wrap up? Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you both for your time and your expertise and your willingness to share. Thank you, Mel. So I'd love to hear from anyone else who we haven't had a chance to hear from, either in the chat or out loud. Nina, hi. Hi, I think one of the things that has happened to me in virtual meetings 
have been, um, I guess you can, you're calling them the tra transition times or whatever. Um, but there's somehow this like inherent need to kind of like continuously connect people in this, in this transitionary period, which is fine. But oftentimes there's like these icebreakers and things that happen and they always feel like really pressured and mandatory <laughs> and I don't love them. Um, what I have really liked is when there's like optional breakout rooms for people to like go in and talk about certain things like that they that is interesting to them, which kind of like can facilitates that connection and stuff in a less like scripted and mandated way. I don't really know how that would look in a large um meeting but um but it certainly has been in smaller meetings something that i've like appreciated <laughs> for sure instead of the more structured things <laughs> totally thank you for sharing that i think that's just an you know an example of one size fits all does not work for all um and i think that um you know there there are defaults everywhere and i think often there is a like a default facilitation or a default meeting mode of particular types of icebreakers that are not actually accessible um, to people with all types of brains. So there's a question in the chat. Um, how did you navigate security concerns over a live stream being taken over by people intending to cause harm? Um, that's interesting, Jay. I think that's a, that is a, a real consideration. And I've definitely been part of events where that that has happened, unfortunately. Um, and I, th I think that um, not only were both, both in the high tech example and in our low tech example, these were not public events. These were private events that were, you know, uh, you were invited, either you were a grantee for this program or you were on our community advisory board or, you know, uh, you know, limited number of people who were invited, registration, password protection. Um, I think that the, you know, public, public Zooms that get out into the world, um, you know, just as whether it's hybrid or, or virtual only, um, you know, I think that um, that's a real consideration. And I think that, you know, one of the things that even, even Brain Club, even Brain Club, you know, our team has a plan that if something happens, we 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 have like like a brain club code like we we have a plan for what we're going to shut down and in what way and people have their roles and i think those kinds of preparations anytime you're interacting um, with a public event is important great question okay well thank you all thank you for so much for being part of this conversation and being part of of this learning experience. And thank you again uh, to Song Win and Evelyn Geerty um, for, for uh, teaching us, teaching us so that, you know, we can all go out into the world and have this, you know, uh, ripple effect outwards um, to work together to build a more inclusive world. Thank you all so much. And I hope that you will join us again next week. Um, next week's Brain Club um, is looking at uh, belonging in the workplace. So we hope hope to see you then. Have a good night and a good week. Bye.